Am I the asshole for telling my husband's kids how broke he was when we met after they insinuated that I was a gold digger? I've, 38 female, been married to my husband, Rob, 52 male, for four years now. My husband's late wife died one year before we met, and we dated two years before getting married. He has two kids, 28, Madison, and 26, Brett. Note, I am not calling them my stepkids because they explicitly told me I am not their stepmom. I am just their dad's wife. I didn't play a part in raising them, so I'm okay with that. It's always been tense between us. I've tried my best to be kind to them and have been generous when I can be, but they are still very cold with me. Being a child of divorce, I can partially relate to a parent moving on, so I try not to force anything. Madison recently got engaged, and we are very excited about it. Everyone was over recently, and she asked about a wedding budget from us, and Rob told her he was able to contribute 10k. She had bigger hopes for her wedding than this, so she was upset and kept asking for more. Rob, however, is still working hard on building his savings back up. Before his late wife died, he basically wiped out his cash savings, had to cash out his 401k, and even took a small mortgage on his house to cover medical costs, as well as life expenses, since he had to cut back on working. Eventually, he had to drop that job for a more flexible but lower paying one, so this 10k is actually really generous for him. Rob went to run an errand and it was just me and his kids. Madison then asked me if I'm going to give any addition to what her dad is giving. I told her we were a marital unit and that's what we discussed together as a reasonable amount to contribute. She then said, quote, I should have known. Obviously, you married an older man for what he had, not for what you could give. I knew she didn't like me, but this is the most flat out rude thing she has ever said. What a brat. You are too old to be acting like that. 28, ma'am. I kind of lost it and said, quote, excuse me? Who do you think has been paying the second mortgage your dad took out to pay his debts? Truth of the matter is, I make more than her father by a large margin. I have no debt and have been paying 70% of the household bills the whole time we've been married. The 10K we are giving her is available because I've been able to subsidize her father's living expenses for the last few years. Did she tell her all this? I hope so. I made it clear that not only... Am I not a gold digger? I am literally wealthier than my older husband. She called me stuck up after this and stormed out. Then she called her dad later and said that I told her that I blamed her mother for being sick for her not having a better wedding budget. I told him what happened and he was oh mad at her, God. but also said I shouldn't have shared his financial details with his kid. You ever have one of those days where you just wake up and you just know that you're gonna go to jail that day? It was back in the day. But I woke up and I was like, I have a bad feeling. Like, I think I'm going to jail today. No matter what you do, they can find you. So go out, stay home, whatever. I did have a couple little things I could do to prepare. One of them being that I put on all my white clothes. Like, put on like, two pairs of socks, a pair of, like, regular underwear, and then a pair of, like, white boxer briefs of my boyfriend's because they're comfy to sleep in. Put on a like a white ribbed tank top. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I just don't want to say the word. I put on like a white t-shirt. So I am strapped. You know, I've got everything. Oh, and of course my bra that doesn't have an underwire. I put that on too. It's summertime and I am bulky, you know, walking around just because I've got this bad feeling. And like, I think I did know that I had a bench warrant out on me, but I had had a run-in with the cops before. Maybe they didn't run my name, but they didn't take me to jail. So I was like, is there a bench warrant? Like, I'm not going to go up there and ask them if there's a bench warrant. Of course, because they're going to run my name. And if I do have one, they'll take me to jail. So I was just out there winging it, right? I'm just sitting on the front porch, minding my business, having a drink, talking to my friends. When all of a sudden, not one, not two, but three police cars. I am freaking five foot three, 120 pounds. I don't need three police cars, but three cop cars come rolling up. As soon as I saw them turn the corner, I was like, they're coming here. And lo and behold, they did. They came right over. There's just nothing to do at that point, you know? I was just like, cool, cool, cool. let me just get a buzz really quick. So I'm drinking and like trying to smoke a cigarette now. And I'm like, okay, go to jail. 
they arrest me. They were like, Miss Cisco, you got a warrant out for your arrest, blah, blah, blah. I get to jail and it's going to cost, I, it was something like $380 to get out, which is just crazy talk because we lived on a fixed income. Like I didn't have an income period. My boyfriend had, he used to get like a check, like a disability check. We got one little check once a month. Of course though, still when you're in jail, you become a hustler and I'm freaking calling every single person I know, I'm calling my grandparents, my mom and dad like different men that I had entertained like I'm calling everybody and trying to get out of jail I can't even call my boyfriend though because he doesn't have a phone that can accept collect calls so I'm not even talking to him and I don't even know if he's out there like trying to get me out I don't know what he's doing he could just be kicking it and I finally talked to this guy and I was like will you please 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 get me out of jail I promise like I will pay you back you know yap 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 well he's him in it all and this was on like a Wednesday and he didn't do it on Wednesday and Thursday rolls around and nothing on Thursday so here comes Friday and once like five o'clock hits on a Friday you're saying the weekend at least in my jail, you couldn't get out on like a Saturday or Sunday. It's even if somebody paid your bond, like because it was a bench where it had to be paid like at this courthouse and it was only open during regular business hours. So I am just looking at the clock and watching it. 3 30. 4. 4 30. And by this point, I'm like, I'm not going home. And I try to like read a book and like just get my head out of it. I look at the clock. It's five minutes after five. And I was just like, crap. Like I'm literally not going home this weekend. I kind of just sit there and I'm in my feelings and feeling sorry for myself. And like maybe I can just go to sleep again for another like 23 hours. And about that time I hear, Cisco, roll it up the best words that have ever been spoken. Now, remember I told you guys I had all that white clothing on? People come run into my room and that's what they did. They would come and see what you wanted to part with because you could theoretically get out and get everything that you wanted because you're a free person. I start stripping things off. You know what? You can have my underwear, box of briefs, socks, bra. You can have it all. But I needed something to like leave in because I've literally been wearing the tank top and the white t-shirt. So I took the white tank top out. No bra. No underwear. No socks. I don't even know who's going to be there to pick me up. I walk out and nobody is there. Nobody is there to pick me up. I am out there in this parking lot in like cut off jean shorts and a white tank top, no bra, just out here. How did I get out? I walk across the street to like the gas station. Like I didn't have a cell phone. I had no way of getting in touch. So I finally I bummed a phone from somebody and I asked them if I could call my boyfriend and I called him and I was like, what's up? I'm out of jail. And he was like, what? I'm on my way. 21-year-old Mara Murray disappeared February 9th of 2004. She was here, there was a car crash, and then she was gone. Now it has been over 20 years and we still have no answers. Let me tell you a little bit something about filming in your car. It's not ideal, but it's possible and that's all we need. Mara's disappearance has been cited as the first crime mystery of the social media age. It was in 2004, right before Facebook came about, but let's get into it. Mara was from Hanson, Massachusetts. She was a fourth child to parents Fred and Lori. When she was little, her parents went through a divorce and Mara would spend most of her time at her mother's house. Mara was gifted in both her academics and sports. She excelled in both. She's been described as hilarious, caring, loving, and thoughtful. Mara went missing on Monday, February 9th of 2004. At the time of her disappearance, she was pursuing a nursing career at the University of Massachusetts. Let's talk about a timeline because all of this is very interesting. Just after midnight that Monday, Mara searches for directions between Amherst, Massachusetts and Burlington, Vermont. Around midday, Mora calls a condo to inquire about reserving a condo in Barlett, New Hampshire. She was presumably looking into booking it to spend some time there. She calls the condo owner, but she doesn't actually book anything. That Monday, Mora sends an email to her professors around 1.24 p.m. to let them know that there had been a death in the family and that she was going to be out for a week and would let them know when she was back. The thing is, there was no death in her family. At 2.05, she calls a hotel in Vermont. She doesn't actually get through to speak to anyone. She just reached a recorded line, but she did call. At 2.18 p.m., she leaves a voicemail for her boyfriend, letting him know that they could talk later. The boyfriend calls back minutes later three times, but Mora does not pick up. 
up. Some people think it has been reported that Mora packed up all of her stuff in her dorm room, but her family has not confirmed that. They have said that she could still have been unpacking from moving in. There really is no way of knowing if she was packing up her stuff or if she was still just in the process of unpacking. It's also been reported that apparently she printed out an email from her boyfriend saying that the boyfriend had cheated on her and she left it out, but the family has not confirmed that either. They said that yes, there was a printed out email from her boyfriend from two years ago, but it was inside a program inside a box. So I'm not sure what to make of that either, but I believe that the family does not think that it was something that Mora left out on purpose to leave some sort of sign. I think she just had that printed out email from a long, long time ago and it was still in a box. Next, Mora goes to her car. She drives to an ATM at 3.15 p.m. She withdraws $280, leaving only $16 in her bank account. She drives to a store she spends $40 there. She gets back in her car and starts driving north. At 4 37 p.m. Mora makes the last phone call that she would ever make. She called to check her voicemail which back then in 2004 you had to call if you wanted to check her voicemail so she didn't actually call anyone she just called to check her missed calls. From 5 to 7 30 p.m. there was no activity on her phone. Just after 7 30 p.m. a woman who lived in the area called to report a car accident that she heard from her house. The car had lost control and slipped off of the road. It was Mora's car. That woman and her husband looked out the same window that night. Initially, the woman said that she thought that she saw a man in the car, but I don't think the husband ever thought that he saw a man in the car, and I think since then, the woman has changed her mind, and she isn't sure now if she did see a man in the car or not. Soon after that, another local resident, a bus driver, sees the car on the side of the road. The bus driver approached the vehicle where he saw Mora. He described her to be shaken up, but not visibly injured. The bus driver tells Mora that he's going to call the police for help. It has been said that Mora asked him to please not call the police. She informed the man that she had already called AAA, and Mora did have a AAA member However, there is no record of AAA ever receiving that phone call. Once the bus driver gets back to his house, he calls police anyway. Police arrive at the scene pretty quickly around 7.46 p.m. But when they get there, Mora has disappeared. She is nowhere to be found and her vehicle is locked. There was two feet of snow on the ground. It was freezing outside. It was dark. Mora is gone. The car had a damaged bumper. The windshield was cracked and both airbags were out. There were red stains found both inside and outside the car. It was a red liquid, so we think that it may have been wine, indicating that she may have been drinking. It is also believed that Mora took some of her belongings with her, but not all of them because inside the car were books, gloves, makeup, and jewelry. But she did take, presumably because they have never been found, were items such as her cell phone and her card, debit and credit card. Inside the vehicle were so many things with Mora's name on it. It was easy to identify the driver of the car. However, Mora's family was not notified of her disappearance until that next Tuesday. Authorities got a hold of one of Mora's older sisters, leaving the entire family confused. Why did she leave school? Where was she going? What could she have been doing in that area? Why why did she leave the car there with some of her stuff inside? And most importantly, where is she? Nobody had a clue and the family was left in a panic and honestly frustrated because the family saw the time between when the car was found to them being notified. As a missed opportunity, the first search did not happen until that next Wednesday, 36 hours after Mora had been gone. That time would have been the most crucial time. Most important minutes, the most important hours, the time that would give us the most answers. It seemed like authorities just decided that they thought that Mora left on her own accord, but the family thought otherwise because nothing made sense. Well, also, another weird thing, when the car was towed, it was taken to the personal garage of the tow truck operator. We don't really know why, but that's weird. 48 hours into the disappearance, Mora's father arrives in the town that she went missing. He heads directly to the police station, expecting to join a search party, expecting for the ball to be rolling, for things to be happening, only to find that the local police station hadn't really done anything at all. Eventually, law enforcement did authorize the search party and search efforts officially began. Tracking dogs were able to track Mora's scent 100 meters down the road, but then eventually lost the scent. Now, Mora disappeared just days after Facebook had launched. The family wanted to take advantage of this new social media to put Mora's name and face out there. And having social media was a great thing because it brought so much awareness and engagement from people who wanted to help. But at the same time, then and even now, as we know, social media can spread a lot of misinformation, a lot of theories that could have the opposite effect on the case. Days passed with no, no new information. 10 days after the disappearance, the FBI joined the search and it quickly became nationwide. They were searching on on foot on helicopters with tracking dogs, cadaver dogs with no luck. On July 1st of 2004, the first search was conducted with no snow on the ground. The search included state troopers, rescue personnel, volunteers. They were focusing primarily within the radius of the car crash in hopes of finding any signs of Mora, any of her belongings, or anything at all that could point them to where she could be. But absolutely nothing conclusive was found. Days turned into weeks, turned into months, turned into years. Mora Murray went missing in 2004. In February of 2019, 15 years later, cadaver dogs 
dogs alerted to a house near the crash site, indicating that something was likely buried underneath that house or in that basement. A team of over a dozen authorities went to the house to dig up the area underneath the basement, feed into the ground, and they found absolutely nothing. This was heartbreaking for the family, for Maura's family, for her dad. The dad, you can see the pain in his eyes from years of fighting his hardest to get any sort of closure and of being unsuccessful every single time. That family has done everything, at times even more than authorities. They have put every ounce of energy in their bodies into finding their loved one and they have it and it's devastating. In 2001, human remains were found in Blue Mountain around 25 miles from where Maura's car was found. The family got hope once again only to be let down once again because it ended up leading to nothing. I've heard one of Maura's older sisters, Julie, speak from her point of view or what she believes is that Maura got into a vehicle and whoever she got in the vehicle with did her harm. Julie does not think that Maura did anything to harm herself. And the reason why a lot of people don't think that Maura did anything to harm herself was because there's no body. If Maura did something to unalive herself or harm herself, surely after 20 years, there would be something, some sort of sign. Her sister Julie has said, quote, I do believe the case is solvable. We just need the few puzzle pieces that are missing. Maura's father has said time and time again, quote, we will be taking you home soon, kid. I say it all the time and I mean it every time. There are so many theories and so many different opinions on this case. I want to know what you guys have to say. I mean, it really is just the most bizarre thing to me when someone goes missing. I have said this before, but think about the amount of people there are in the world. Again, how can not one person know something? Somebody knows something. Just recently, Maura's sister, Julie, has started a podcast. It's called Media Pressure, The Untold Story of Maura Murray. Julie takes control of the narrative and she breaks down the case from her perspective. Gr After midnight, we aren't allowed to go downstairs alone. The town I live in is nice enough. It's quiet, a little quaint. My dream has always been to move to the city when I get older. I live a life where things are busier, more exciting, more alive. Right now, I live at home with my parents and my twin sister. Both of my parents are underpaid teachers, so we live a modest life. We've never been spoiled and we've always been told to work hard for every dollar. Having gratitude for everything we have has been instilled in us since childhood. My parents must have worked really hard to save money throughout the years because the house that I lived in as a teen was pretty darn huge. Our tiny little town in general is relatively prestigious. So I do my part to extract wisdom from my parents whenever possible because they clearly know how to win at life. But of all the things that my parents ask of me and my sister, the one rule they are most stern about is if you're going downstairs after midnight, you have to bring someone with you. Ever since we moved into this house, they would remind us of that rule every chance that they got. They would randomly bring it up at the dinner table or right before we're off to school. Sometimes if they heard footsteps in the hallway at night, they would get out of bed and walk with us to wherever we were going in the house. The strange thing about it was that me and my sister never really had anywhere to go downstairs at night. Anyways, our rooms, the living room, kitchen, and everything else pretty much was upstairs. Upstairs just had a game room and some storage that we might need to pull out from time to time. But overall, I couldn't really think of a scenario where we would need to go downstairs at night. My sister and I would ask my parents about it sometimes. Why do we have this rule and what happens if we break it? They would usually deflect, change the subject, or tell us, we'll tell you when you're older. As I got older and older, the fact that my whole family slept upstairs in a two-story house became weirder and weirder to me. I was curious about what exactly was going on. So fresh off my 20th birthday, I decided to conjure up some kind of situation where I would absolutely have to go downstairs after 12 a.m. As soon as it turned 12 a.m., I yelled to my mom. Mom, I left my laptop in the game room and I have a paper due tomorrow. Lame excuse, I know. She was skeptical and pushed back a little bit, but finally she caved. We made our way down the small staircase and headed for the door that led to downstairs. But before my mother opened it, she turned to me. She said, okay, he's likely gonna latch onto me. Um, what? Make sure I don't open the door to the backyard and that I'm with you at all times, okay? Okay? You can pull me if you need to. I thought she was kidding. She opened the door. Our downstairs area has another small living room, a small kitchen, and a hallway that leads to the game area. I had accidentally left my laptop in the game area. So when we entered, I immediately turned toward the hallway. I thought my mom would follow me. Instead, I saw her just standing there. She was shivering and jittery. Her gaze was fixed on the window in the kitchen. It's a big window with the blinds usually pulled up and it looks directly into our backyard. I looked at my mom confused and she continued her uninterrupted stare. Slowly, she started walking towards the door to our backyard. I started to ask, mom, what are you? And that's when I saw him. He was pressed against the window from the outside. His face was obscured by the darkness, but I could see his eyes. They were wide open, wider than eyes should go. My mom just continued to walk towards the door. I grabbed her as hard as I could and pulled her back, all the way back to the staircase that led upstairs. And then I closed the door behind us. It took my mom a minute to snap out of it.
This is the case of the real-life Jigsaw Killer, where in 2009, body parts were being found all around England. On the morning of March 22nd, 2009, a farmer found a mysterious duffel bag just abandoned on his property. Inside the bag was something wrapped in plastic and duct tape that the farmer described as being large and squishy. The authorities were quickly called to the grisly discovery. Inside of the bag was the left leg of a human being. And then one week later, about a 30 five minute drive from the first discovery a second gruesome discovery was found a forearm elbow to wrist was just found on the side of the road and then two days later another discovery was found this was about a hundred miles away and this is so terrifying it was a head but the head was missing its ears the eyes were removed the nose was removed the mouth was removed pretty much all identifying features the only thing left was the person's teeth and at this point, the fact that there's been body parts just being found all across England is a huge media story. Literally everyone is talking about this. There's mass panic for everyone throughout the UK. They are living a real life horror movie. And this is really horrific and wrong. I'm really gonna piss a lot of you guys off. But at this point, the media starts referring to the victim as Jigsaw Man because he was missing so many pieces. And about a week later, the right leg was found about a mile away from where the left leg was found. And this leg was also wrapped in plastic and duct tape. And then four days after that, a suitcase was found abandoned in a ditch. And just imagine the fear of walking your dog and finding this after weeks of people finding body parts in bags. And then you just see a suitcase abandoned in a ditch. And what really gets me is that everyone just keeps opening these bags that they're finding, even though it's been spread all across the media that people are finding body parts in bags could not have been me if I found a suitcase in a ditch and people have been finding body parts all across the country would not have opened the bag but the man that was just walking his dog and found the suitcase did open the bag inside the bag was a torso and also another arm they were able to determine that the victim had died by being stabbed to death they also could determine that all of the body parts that have been found belonged to the same victim and that the victim was male but they were unable to identify the victim because his dna was not in the system it's been three weeks of people finding body parts throughout the entire country there's mass panic and investigators had zero leads they have no answers for anyone they can't even identify the victim even though at this point they pretty much have an entire body they have no choice but to beg the public for help. Does anyone know the man in their life, a loved one that has been missing for about a month? They end up getting a lot of leads of people thinking that maybe their loved one could be this potential victim, this jigsaw man. But none of the leads were really panning out. Either the height would be wrong, the person would have identifying tattoos or different identifying markings, the race would be wrong, how long the person had been missing didn't really line up. Until they got a call from a mother whose son had mysteriously disappeared about a month ago and that man was named Jeffrey. How? See, Jeffrey was the kind of guy with a heart of gold who was constantly keeping in touch with his friends and family. So when he just randomly went MIA for a month, people were really concerned. So investigators went to Jeffrey's house to see if maybe he's there, if there's any leads. While Jeffrey was not there, there were two people living in his house. Inside of the home was a 38 year old man named Stephen Marshall and his 21 year old girlfriend. Stephen introduced himself as a co-worker of Jeffrey's and he said that he had been down on his luck. So Jeffrey allowed him to live with him rent free until he got back on his feet. Stephen and his girlfriend also did not seem concerned at all that their roommate had been missing for a month. They never reported him missing, tried to find out where he was. And they also said that they had no idea where he could possibly be. Stephen and Sarah were both brought in for questioning and both of them were being seriously uncooperative. They weren't asking any questions, but that was fine because investigators really wanted to get them out of the house so they could search Jeffrey's house. Investigators said that the house was suspiciously clean, but there wasn't really any other evidence. So they actually started to rip up the carpet, which I'm not even sure is something that you can do without probable cause, but it was a good thing that they did it because they ended up finding large amount of blood stains in the bathroom and in the bedroom. It was clear that a murder had taken place here by the sheer amount of blood that they were able to find under the carpet, but they still needed to identify Jeffrey as their dismembered victim, which they luckily were able to do with his dental records but they also needed to prove that Jeffrey's roommates Stephen and Sarah were the ones that committed this murder because these were their prime suspects at this point so apparently there were green fibers that were stuck in the duct tape that had been wrapped around some of the body parts so inside of Jeffrey's home 
they start just taking anything that's green and made of fabric so they can test it with these green fibers and they did get a match on a shirt that belonged to Steven so it wasn't looking good so Steven and Sarah were both arrested and then they needed to find a motive and they quickly found one which was money in the days after killing Jeffrey Howe Steven and Sarah sold a lot of his belongings and also were charging things on his credit cards so through the money that they got from selling his belongings and also the charges on his credit card, Stephen and Sarah stole about $5,000 from Jeffrey. This is a man that let them live with him rent free and he lost his life for $5,000. That was all Jeffrey Howe was worth to these two evil people. And Stephen and Sarah, who were boyfriend and girlfriend before this, tried to turn on each other, blame the other one, said that the other one killed Jeffrey, but eventually they both did plead guilty for their roles in this crime. Before their sentencing, both Stephen and Sarah were given an opportunity to address the court, speak to the judge. Most people use this opportunity to apologize, show remorse, even blame their actions on their terrible childhood, but that's not what Stephen does. Stephen just gets up and says, this is not the first time I've done this before. I'm assuming that he just wanted to clear his conscience or something because he just gets up and admits to the court that he had previously worked for a gang and his job in the gang was to dismember and dispose of the gang's victims. Stephen was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 36 years and Sarah was sentenced to three years and nine months. So she is out right now living as a free woman. Am I the asking for refusing to cover my coworker's shifts after she called me lazy for not having kids? I, 28 female, work full-time in retail, and as anyone who's worked retail knows, it can be pretty exhausting. I've got a busy life outside of work, trying to balance my hobbies, taking care of my apartment, seeing friends, and just taking care of myself. You know, normal adult stuff. I don't have kids, but that doesn't mean I'm lounging around with endless free time. One of my coworkers, Sarah, 32 female, has two young kids. She's always asking people to cover her shifts, which I understand because being a mom is hard and things come up. Over the past year, I've covered for her quite a few times when she had to leave early or couldn't make it in because some kind of kid emergency. I did it out of kindness because I get that life can be unpredictable and I wanted to help her out. But I've started to notice that I'm one of the only ones she she asks to help cover her shifts. It's like she expects me to do it just because I don't have the same responsibilities as she does. Last week, she asked me again to cover for her because her kid had a school event. Normally, I'd try to help, but I already had plans to spend the day with my sister, who I hadn't seen in a while. I told Sarah that I couldn't this time, and she just sighed and said, Must be nice to have all that free time. You don't have kids, so it's not like you're busy with anything important. I was pretty taken aback. I told her, just because I don't have kids doesn't mean I don't have a life. My time is important, too. She kind of rolled her eyes and walked away, but I could tell she wasn't happy with me. Now she's been telling our other coworkers that I'm selfish, and I don't understand how hard it is to be a mom. A couple of them has started acting a bit distant toward me, and I overheard one of them saying something like, She has it easy. No wonder she doesn't get it. I didn't realize not having kids made me less deserving of respect at work. What really gets me is that I've always tried to help when I could, but just because I don't have kids doesn't mean my life is suddenly stress-free or that I can drop everything at a moment's notice. I feel like Sarah doesn't respect my time at all, and that really bothers me. I ended up mentioning it to my manager, hoping for a little understanding, but they just said it's a personal conflict and didn't want to get involved. So now I'm stuck feeling like the bad guy because I said no for once. I honestly don't think it's fair to expect me to cover her shifts all the time just because I don't have children. I have responsibilities too and I deserve to have a life outside of work. But some of my coworkers seem to think that I should be helping out more because Sarah's a mom and I'm not. Am I being selfish here? Am I the astronaut for finally standing my ground and refusing to cover her shifts after she basically called me lazy? Am I in the wrong for canceling all of our streaming services to hire a housekeeper without asking my husband first? I'm 28 female, and me and my husband, 30 male, just welcomed our first baby almost three months ago. Understandably, it's been a huge adjustment for both of us. She's still not sleeping through the night, and we're both back to working full time. We have always let the household responsibilities 50-50. We just help where needed, and it's always worked out well. Lately, my husband has been doing the chores terribly, and I've had to come behind him to fix things or clean them again. For example, he cleaned bottles the other night and they were cleaned so poorly that I had to do them again. He dropped pump parts down the disposable and then ran in and ruined them. There have been several clothes that he didn't clean after a blowout and they're now ruined. There are many more instances like this. I've confronted him a few times letting him know that we all make mistakes and I know that we're both tired, but it feels like he's not even trying to do things well. He just keeps saying that he's so tired and is having a hard time working and taking care of the house and baby. 
I do sympathize with this as I'm also working, pumping, recovering, and taking care of the house and baby. The final straw for me was when he told me to go to sleep and he put up the milk that I just pump and finish the dishes. I was so grateful until I got up and realized that the milk had been sitting on the counter and at this point was no good anymore. He said that he was sorry and he put on a show to relax for a bit before doing the dishes and fell asleep. The next day, I decided to cancel all of our streaming services, PlayStation Plus, and our theme park passes in order to hire a housekeeper. I figured if he's too tired to do basic household chores, then a housekeeper is necessary. If he's too tired to put up milk, then he's too tired to play video games or for us to go to the theme park. We still have cable in the PlayStation games and can do other activities outside of the local theme park. He blew up at me saying that I had no right to do that and was furious. I thought I was doing us a favor so that we can get more sleep and not worry as much about household tasks. So am I in the wrong for hiring a housekeeper without asking?